Hey all, so now we're talking about Hellboy. Uh, this is kind of one that snuck up on me because uh, while I had always kind of heard about it, it was one of those where uh, if they ever made it into a movie, it was going to be hard to adapt, largely because it is one of those adult comic books. And for a while, their Dark Horse was able to produce a lot of really interesting comics that got um, adapted into really fascinating shows. And you had really good challengers to a lot of the uh, more conventional ones. Uh, one of my personal favorites was The Big Guy and Rusty. But you had a lot of different uh, variations on it. And basically, with Hellboy, it was such a deviation from the usual... Uh, fair because you would get like you know people with superpowers but rarely did um, you ever have someone who out and out battled mythical beasts and magical creatures where everything was based on legends and superstitions and it just was a world in which all of this happened that being said um, I was a big fan of the first two Hellboys but you only had two produced. And despite the fact that they were beautifully executed between um, Hellboy 1 with its phenomenal storyboarding, I mean, they actually mapped out scenes with really interesting graphics. One of my favorite scenes is when Hellboy is trying to write a letter to Liz and you just see piles of crumpled letters, including... Uh, one that clearly reads Dear Liz and it has some other writing in it. I thought that visually it was excellent and Guillermo del Toro, I can't believe I managed to say his name, it's really difficult for me. Anyway, he uh, is an excellent director and was able to get a lot of uh, funding for uh, producing movies like uh, Pan's Labyrinth, which got all this praise, especially for the makeup and special effects. And later, The Shape of Water, because he was able to move in with these um, more conventional projects. And as I recall, he uh, went into producing Pacific Rim and ended up not doing the uh, Hobbit movies, which led to Peter Jackson being roped in to direct them and produce them. Now, getting back to the actual Hellboy series, I think that it was largely Del Toro that held back the series because he wasn't willing or able, I don't know which it was, to pass the reins on, as it were. With the Superman franchise, the, I'm talking about the very early Superman movies, you had Richard Donner, who directed, uh, I think it was The Omen, and he did an excellent job directing Superman 1 in terms of using the conventional direction at the time to, and all of the conventional special effects to create this really magical Superman movie that was just lightning in a bottle. And because of the nature of uh, the way that the first two Superman films were produced, back to back by the time they started promoting Superman 1 because editing and special effects were done Donner had been fired by Alexander and Ilya Salkind who were the producers uh, out of Italy if I'm remembering all of this correctly so with that Donner did all of his best to try and wrap up Superman 1 but he was kind of taken off the project right part way through the production of Superman 2. And the result was that you had the ending for Superman 2 where he flies around the world super fast and reverses time. And that um, unfortunately ended up being the ending of Superman 1. Whereas in Superman 1, he does what a lot of people actually figure out Superman would do because he has super speed. He flies in the air, gets both missiles, sends them off into space, and saves uh, uh, the whole west coast of America just in time. Now, 
again, I keep going off on tangents, but this is an important aspect of movie making and storytelling. When you're telling stories with both of the Ron Perlman, Guillermo, Guillermo, see, I can't say it, Guillermo del Toro movies, uh, you have an aging actor playing Hellboy. I think by that time he was in his late 50s, early 60s, uh, Ron Perlman was. You know, so it wasn't like we were talking Ron Perlman back in the 90s when he was a little bit younger and could have held up with the pace of filming a little bit more. Now he tends to do voice acting a bit more often, and that's about it. And he's a big guy, and big guys have a hard time with really physically demanding uh, jobs where you have to do a lot of stunts and everything. So I kind of appreciated that they passed the reins for the actor over to David Harbour. And, you know, looking at David Harbour, obviously he's got the height, but more importantly, he didn't need much in the way of makeup to get the right look. Uh, they gave him makeup that still enabled him to act through it, and I'm sure that a certain portion of it was just facial tracking so that they could, um, so that they could fill in, as it were. Um, with uh, CGI because any Hellboy movie is going to require a lot of CGI. And that was actually something that held back the Del Toro productions of Hellboy was they wanted so much of it to be physical, practical effects. And unfortunately, if you're going to have a magical creature like some of what was featured in the first two Hellboy movies, you have to rely more and more on CGI to kind of fill in the gap. Now, the main issue with that is that you have to have really good actors with excellent cues and direction to take that to the level that they need when they're acting and reacting and delivering lines. They have to be looking in the right spot. They have to be emoting just the right way. Everything has to be just so. Even if they fill in uh, the lines with ADR to get the emphasis a little bit better, you still have to factor a lot of that in. But uh, with the Del Toro ones, it was always kind of held back. The best productions that I've seen of Hellboy stories for home video or mass release, however you want to refer to it, is uh, the animated ones. And a lot of those were taken directly from comics. You had Hellboy and the Sword of Storms, for example. Uh, and these would feature the voices of the cast from the Del Toro incarnations. Now, the Del Toro ones were good. There is no argument about that. You can watch them. You can enjoy them. They have decent casting. Um, except for Seth MacFarlane. I can't stand his character in the second one. Um, mostly, I just can't stand his acting. But that's me. I think that they should have actually had a German uh, play a German. Anyway, that's just my gripe because I'm a fan of The Longest Day where French people played French people, Britons played Britons, Americans played Americans, and Germans played Germans. I like it when we don't have people of other ethnicities playing parts uh, more as caricatures, which is what you got with Seth MacFarlane who, just by his name, you can tell, is a little bit Irish. Anyway, um, so getting back to the David Harbour uh, version of Hellboy from 2019. What's good, what's bad? Well, first off, the villain is really good. Uh, you have a female villain in this, which is great because they're basing it on Arthurian legend around Nimue, the Blood Queen, and I like that. You're going with a lesser-known Arthurian legend, one that isn't pretty, and you're going with a female villain instead of uh, going with kind of what we had uh, in the first one, which was just a male villain in Rasputin, revived from the dead, and uh, yeah, spoiler alert there, if you haven't seen the version of Hellboy from, like, I think it was 2005 or something. Um, 
Yeah, that whole that whole particular production was so slowed down. Uh, this one seemed to move a lot faster, largely because they were using lesser known talents. Uh, they were prioritizing uh, getting principal shooting and photography done, and having so much of the uh, second unit footage done in neat and tidy orders that can kind of expedite production. That's the main thing. Uh, You had Professor Broom, played by Ian McShane, which, while not my pick for the character, uh, I still thought was really good. I mean, the previous one died in the first film, so this is one in which he's alive again, and, spoiler, he dies in this one too seems to be his one role is to die but they make a little bit less of a poetic deal about it of the whole fatherhood thing and what makes the measure of a man and so on and so forth this one he actually goes on a few different adventures and it's really exciting and rewarding to get that out of this you get a fair amount of action but also a lot of good story and dialogue you get character development. You get different arcs with some of the different characters. I thought it was a little bit funny uh, that they cast... Um, I'm pretty sure it was Daniel Day Kim. I noticed that they had Thomas Hayden Church as uh, a character just in the past for no like clear reason. It was just He was just there as... You know, only Thomas Hayden Church can kind of be, and he was kind of hamming it up a little bit. Yeah, it was Daniel Day Kim. Uh, And he plays kind of a side character. Thomas Hayden Church plays a small part, has a little cameo, but he makes it work. It's good. It's him. It's, you know, um, I was just recently watching um, some episodes of Wings from, God, something like almost 25 years ago. And um, that was where he really got his start as an actor was on this uh, sitcom where at first he had a small part as just the uh, airport mechanic. And then he um, got a bigger and bigger part as um, as uh, the series went on and they just decided to start writing some more stories centered around him or involving him in some way. Uh, But Daniel Day Kim plays uh, kind of a... British agent who doesn't quite know what to make of Hellboy. There are some wonderful twists around all of this, and I really uh, was surprised by the twists in the story. Uh, They really lead you through uh, a lot of different turns uh, throughout all of this. Uh, And I think that the CGI was relatively seamless. Like, while you can easily tell that it's CGI and you can tell that this is Hellboy dealing with a lot of this stuff I think they had the actor actually doing enough stuff in the middle of a of a field with all these things as the camera followed him around and they also make sure to actually have the camera changing positions constantly since this is a battle in a field they're going ahead and breaking the rule of uh, changing the position of one character versus another because you are just following Hellboy. So the rule is that you don't change the character's positions on a screen unless you show them changing positions. Imagine if it's like Mortal Kombat and you have the two fighters um, you know, facing each other. You don't flip the camera to the other side to show them facing opposite directions unless they have somehow switched places because it just is how you do it with storytelling and everything unless you are maintaining focus and centering the camera on one particular character which in this case they do they focus on Hellboy which is why that particular scene when he's battling three giants like really ugly uh, misshapen giants it's kind of why it works. Um, it's risky, and they don't do it 
too many other places, they try not to break that rule too often. Um, because you do have to maintain location of who is where in relation to one another. Uh, and in a big open field full of trees, that's very difficult to do. In other situations where they do that, you have a sense of who is located in reference to what else is there because there's architecture, certain features, furnishings, and things like that that help give the audience a grounding that, oh yes, the camera and the audience has changed locations from where we're looking, but we're generally maintaining the focus on characters. So um, one example might be in another scene where Hellboy and Dr. Uh, Broom are sitting at a table and Hellboy's friend Alice is sitting on the other side of the table from Hellboy with Broom at the end of the table between them. You have to have the camera change locations a few times, but you still have each character in the same place relative to the other around this table. So it's a very important and underappreciated aspect of the art of visual storytelling. So when you're watching it, just pay attention to little things like that, that they actually do put that emphasis there. And they do, they help you not lose track of everything. Because in this particular film, it is very easy to lose track with all of the fight scenes and all of the action that's going on and all of the weird locations. One particular scene that was especially good was where Hellboy meets Baba Yaga. And for those who don't know, Baba Yaga is a sort of evil fairy witch. Um, the t more accurate term is uh, witch or hag. And in Eastern European mythos, uh, she lives out in the woods in a hut with, um, and it's a magical hut, and it has chicken legs and feet that... Um, hide under it and it'll just move around uh, from one place to the other and she snatches up children and eats them um, and she's kind of a she's obviously a very dark figure and it's meant to keep um, parents um, you know it, it's meant to keep parents and children kind of from having the kids wander too much into the woods uh where it can be dangerous, you know, oh, don't go into the woods or Baba Yaga will get you. You know, or don't stay in the woods after dark or Baba Yaga will get you. And it's one of those things that has a practical sense to it uh, in terms of the nature of it, but it's something that didn't migrate outside of, um, outside of anywhere else in the world, so to speak. Uh, but there are myths around uh, the woods, such as uh, fairy folk uh, kidnapping babies or uh, leading people to madness or making it so they can never leave the woods. Uh, that's more of an English tradition. And they do bring that up here, which I thought was great. As someone who has read uh, a fair amount of uh, poetry and uh, and uh, some stories and legends centered around all of that. It's always very interesting to me to see what they do with that in a more contemporary and updated uh, sense of things. Where do we put these creatures in our modern world? Um, and they do a really good job of adapting that here. They use a lot of CGI for it to just keep it simple have it be a little bit easier to animate. They get the shots, and then they send it off to uh, post-production to get the CGI taken care of. That, to me, is great because it expedites the storytelling process, and they just made sure to have the writing be tight so you don't feel like something got left out on the cutting room floor for time. You feel like this is a complete story, and you aren't being... You haven't got any details left out, like with so many other productions that you see. Um, a lot of the costumes and designs, they try to expedite and they try to leave a certain amount up to uh, CGI, but they also do 
uh, some that are very obviously practical designs, or they try to have an actor on there with a somewhat practical costume. Uh, one example might be the Warthog. That one, for most of the shots, seems to be a real costume. For some of the scenes involving Mila Jovovich as Nimue, uh, they have her in a certain setup, and they have hand doubles and leg doubles because Nimue, for part of the film, is cut up into pieces. She's been quartered. Uh, but, yeah, it's a good, strong movie and a solid performance all around. Um, a, a really decent action adventure. And if you're kind of a fan of Doom Patrol, uh, which uh, I've been I've been uh, watching Doom Patrol re- pretty regularly. I've been really enjoying that series from uh, DC. I think you'll really get a kick out of Hellboy. It's a much more adult storytelling, so don't put sit the kitties down and have them watch it, or they will have nightmares. This is good nightmare fuel for the kiddos. Um, you'll want to. Um, you know, maybe watch this with teenagers. Teenagers would appreciate it, especially some of the dialogue between Hellboy and Professor Broom, because it is very much like a teenager talking with uh, a parent. And they wrote it that way. And it's appropriate because of the way that Hellboy ages. Um, as uh, they put it in the Del Toro franchise, uh, reverse dog years, basically. So... Uh, Seven years of our life is equivalent to one year of his. Anyway, uh, they retell a little bit of his origin story for people who haven't read the comics or people who haven't seen the Del Toro series. So you don't have to watch the Del Toro series to know what's going on here because it's really a reboot. But it's good, is the thing. And the nice part there is that instead of waiting years to get another sequel we might only have to wait a year or two to get another sequel and i really appreciate this film i'm not going to tell you how it ends because like any good reviewer i don't do that it isn't about the ending uh the whole point here is to tell you some high points of the storytelling some interesting plot points that happen um and whether or not it's well made And the fact is, this is a well-made movie. I was genuinely pleased by this uh, when I didn't know what the heck to expect. But they did a genuinely good job here. And I think you will be pleasantly surprised, too, and have a lot of fun. And hopefully you'll look forward to uh, another, uh, another film coming out. They already got the sequel bait there where they um, do a little... They don't do it after the credits because... I think uh I think uh the producers there realized that since Marvel does that and DC was doing that with some of its movies and it's annoying you might as well just put your little post or mid credit roll sequence right there at the end just to entertain people and uh it's a good payoff and it's really good sequel bait so I think you'll have a lot of fun with it uh definitely check it out Hellboy 2019 uh, yeah, I'm 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 gonna give this one a good five out of five. It it is extremely satisfying. Uh, it's not overly long. It's very creative, and uh, yeah, I think you'll have a really good time with it. So check it out. Anyway, uh, if you want to, please click like, click subscribe, ding the bell to so you'll get updates. And if you want to donate to my Patreon campaign, username Clada. Oh, and uh, you can also follow me on social media. So take care. Bye-bye.